morning friends. Chapter 42. The Whiteness of the Whale. What the white whale was to Ahab has been hinted. What at times he was to me as yet remains unsaid. Aside from those more obvious considerations touching Moby Dick, which could not but occasionally awaken in any man's soul some alarm, there was another thought, or rather vague, nameless horror concerning him, which at times by its intensity completely overpowered all the rest, and yet so mystical and well-nigh ineffable was it that I almost despair of putting it in a comprehensible form. It was the whiteness of the whale that above all things appalled me. But how can I hope to explain myself here, and yet in some dim random way explain myself I must, else all these chapters might be not. Though in many natural objects whiteness refinedly enhances beauty, as if imparting some spiritual virtue of its own, as in marbles, japonicas, and pearls. And though various nations have in some way recognized a certain royal preeminence in this hue, even the barbaric grand old kings of Pegu placing the title Lord of the White Elephants above all the, all their other magnilo, magniloquent <laughs> ascriptions of dominion, and the modern kings of Siam unfurling the same snow-white quadruped in the royal standard, and the Hanoverian flag bearing the one figure of a snow-white charger, and the great Austrian empire, Caesarian, heir to the overlording Rome, having for the imperial color the same imperial hue, and though this preeminence in it applies to the human race itself, giving the white man ideal mastership over every dusky tribe, and though besides all this whiteness has been even made significant of gladness, for among the Romans a white stone marked a joyful day, and though in other mortal symp sympathies and symbolizings, the same hue has made the emblem of many touching noble things, the innocence of brides, the benignity of age. Though among the red men of America the giving of the white belt of wampum was the deepest pledge of honor, though in many climes whiteness typifies the majesty of justice in the ermine of the judge, and contributes to the daily state of kings and queens drawn by milk-white steeds, though even in the higher mysteries of the most august religions it has been made the symbol, symbol of divine spotlessness and power, by the Persian fire-worshippers the white-forked flame, being held the holiest on the altar, and in the Greek mythologies, great Jove himself, being made incarnate in the snow-white bull, and though to the noble Iroquois, the midwinter sacrifice of the sacred white dog was by far the holiest festival of their theology, that spotless faithful creature being held the purest envoy they could send to the great spirit with the annual tidings of their own fidelity. And though directly from the Latin word for white, all Christian priests derive the name of one part of their sac sacred vesture, the alb or tunic, worn beneath the cassock, and though among the holy pomps of the Romish faith, white is specially employed in the celebration of the Passion of our Lord, though in the vision of St. John white robes are given to the redeemed, and the four and twenty elders stand clothed in white before the great white throne, and the holy one that sitteth there white like wool. Yet for all these accumulated associations with whatever is sweet and honorable and sublime, there yet lurks an elusive something in the innermost idea of this hue, which strikes more of panic to the soul than that redness which affrights in blood. This elusive quality it is which causes the thought of whiteness, when divorced from more kindly associations and coupled with any object terrible in itself, to heighten that terror to the furthest bounds. Witness the white bear of the poles, the white shark of the tropics. What but their smooth, flaky whiteness makes them the transcendent, transcendent horrors they are, that ghastly whiteness. It is which imparts such an abhorrent mildness, even more loathsome than terrific, to the dumb gloating of their aspect so that not the fierce-fanged tiger in his heraldic coat can so stagger courage as the white-shrouded bear or shark. Bethink thee of the albatross, whence come those clouds of spiritual wonderment and pale dread in which that white phantom sails in all imaginations, not Coleridge, first through that spell, but God's great unflattering lorite nature. Most famous in our western annals and Indian traditions is that of the white steed of the prairies, a magnificent milk-white charger, large-eyed, small-headed, bluff-chested, and with the dignity of a thousand monarchs in his lofty, over-scorning carriage. He was the elected Xerxes of vast herds of wild horses, whose pastures in those days were only fenced by the Rocky Mountains and the Alleghenies. At their flaming head he westward trooped it like that chosen star which every evening leads on the, leads on the host of light. The flashing cascade of his mane, the curving comet of his tail, invested him with housings more resplendent than gold and silver beaters could have furnished him. A most imperial and arch-angelical arch apparition of that unfallen western world, 
which to the eyes of the old trappers and hunters revived the glories of these primeval times when Adam walked majestic as a god, bluff-browed and fearless as this mighty steed, whether marching amid his aides and marshals in the van of countless cohorts that endlessly streamed it over the plains, like in Ohio, or whether with his circumbient subjects browsing all around the horizon, the white steed gallopingly reviewed them with warm nostrils reddening through his cool milkiness, in whatever aspect he presented himself, always to the bravest Indians, he was the object of trembling reverence and awe. Not can it be questioned from what stands on legendary record of this noble horse, that it was his spiritual whiteness chiefly which so clothed him with divineness, and that this divineness had that in it which, though commanding worship, at the same time enforced a certain nameless terror. But there are other instances where this whiteness loses all that accessory and strange glory which invests it in the white steed and albatross. What is it that in the albino man so peculiar, peculiarly repels and often shocks the eye, as that sometimes he is loathed by his own kith and kin? It is that whiteness which invests him, a thing expressed by the name he bears, the albino, is as well made as other men, has no substantive deformity, and yet this mere aspect of all-pervading whiteness makes him more strangely hideous than the ugliest abortion. That's not my opinion. <laughs> Why should this be so? Nor in quite other aspects. Does nature, in their least palpable but not the less malicious agencies, fail to enlist among her, fo her forces this crowning attribute of the terrible. From its snowy aspect, the gaunt gauntleted ghost of the southern seas has been denominated the white squall, nor in some historic instances has the art of human malice omitted so potent an auxiliary. How wildly it heightens the effect of that passage in Frosart, Frosart, when masked in the snowy symbol of their faction, the desperate white hoods of Ghent, white hoods of Ghent murder their bailiff in the marketplace. Nor in some things does the common hereditary experience of all mankind fail to bear witness of the supernaturalism of this hue. It cannot well be doubted that the one visible quality in the aspect of the dead which most appalls the gazer is the marble pallor lingering there, as if indeed that pallor were as much like the badge of consternation in the other world as of mortal trepidation here. And from that pallor of the dead we borrow the expressive hue of the shroud in which we wrap them, not even in our superstitions do we fail to throw the same snowy mantle round our phantoms, all ghosts rising in a milk-white fog. Yea, while these terrors seize us, let us add that even the king of terrors, when personified by the evangelist, rides on his pallid horse. Therefore, in his other moods, symbolizes whatever grand or gracious thing he will by whiteness. No man can deny that in its profoundest idealized significance it calls up a peculiar apparition of the soul. But though without dissent this point be fixed, how is mortal man to account for it? To analyze it would seem impossible. Can we then, by the citation of some of those instances wherein this thing of whiteness, for the, though for the time either wholly or in great part stripped of all direct association, calculated to impart it to it aught fearful, but nevertheless is found to exert over us the same sorcery, however modified, can we thus hope to light upon some chance clue to conduct us to the hidden cause we seek? Let us try. But in a matter like this, subtly, subtlety appeals to subtlety, and without imagination no man can follow another into these halls, and though doubtless some at least of the imaginative impressions about, about to be presented may have been shared by most men, yet few perhaps were entirely conscious of them at the time, and therefore may not be able to recall them now, why to the man of untutored ideality, ideality, who happens to be but loosely acquainted with the peculiar character of the day, does the bare does the bare mention of Whitsuntide marshal in the fancy such long, dreary, speechless processions of low, pa slow pacing pilgrims, downcast and hooded with new fallen snow, or to the unread, unsophisticated pro protestant of the middle American states? Why does the passing mention of a white friar or a white nun evoke such an eyeless statue of the soul? What is there apart from the traditions of dungeoned warriors and kings, which will not wholly account for it, what makes the White Tower of London tell so much more strongly on the imagination of an untraveled American than those who than those other storied structures, its neighbors, the Byward Tower, or even the Bloody? And those sublimer towers, the White Mountains of New Hampshire, whence, in peculiar moods, comes that gigantic ghostliness over the soul at the bare mention of that name, while the thought of Virginia's Blue Ridge 
is full of soft, dewy, distant dreaminess. But why, irrespective of all latitudes and longitudes, does the name of the White Sea exert such a spectralness over the fancy, while that of the Yellow Sea lulls us with mortal thoughts of long, lacquered, mild afternoons on the waves, followed by the gaudiest and yet sleepiest of sunsets? Or to choose the wholly unsubstantial instance purely addressed to the fancy, why, in reading the old fairy tales of Central Europe, does the tall, pale man of the heart's forest, whose changeless pal pallor unrustingly glides through the green of the groves. Why is this phantom more terrible than all the whooping imps of the Bloxburg? Nor is it altogether the remembrance of her cathedral top toppling earthquakes, nor the stampedos of her frantic seas, nor the cheerlessness of arid skies that never rain, nor the sight of her wide field of leaning spires, wrenched copestones and crosses all adroop, like canted yards of anchored fleets and her suburban avenues of house walls lying over upon each other as a tossed pack of cards. It is not these things alone which make tearless Lima, the strangest, saddest city thou canst see. For Lima has taken the white veil, and there is a higher horror in this whiteness of her woe. Old as Pizarro, this whiteness keeps her ruins forever new, admits not the cheerful greenness of complete decay, spreads over her broken ramparts the rigid pallor of an apoplexy that fixes its own distortions. I know that, to the common apprehension. This phenomenon of whiteness is not confessed to be the prime agent in exaggerating the terror of objects otherwise terrible, nor to the unimaginative mind is there aught of terror in those appearances whose awfulness to another mind almost solely consists in this one phenomenon, especially when exhibited under any form at all approaching to muteness or universality. What I mean by these two statements may perhaps be respectively elucidated by the following examples. First, the mariner, when drawing nigh the coasts of foreign lands, if by night he hears the roar of breakers, starts to vigilance, and feels just enough of trepidation to sharpen all his faculties. But under precisely similar circumstances, let him be called from his hammock to view his ship sailing through a midnight sea of milky whiteness, as if from encircling headlands shoals of combed white bears were swimming round him, and he feels a silent, superstitious dread. The shrouded phantom of the whitened waters is horrible to him as a real ghost. In vain, the lead assures him he is still off soundings. Heart and helm, they both go down. He never rests till blue water is under him again. Yet where is the mariner who will tell thee, Sir, it was not so much the fear of striking hidden rocks as the fear of that hideous whiteness that so stirred me. Second, to the native Indian of Peru, the continual sight of the snow howdahead Andes conveys not of dread except perhaps in the mere fancying of the eternal frosted desolateness reigning at such vast altitudes, and the natural conceit of what a fear fearfulness it would be to lose oneself in such inhuman solitudes. Much the same it, is it with the backwoodsmen of the West, with the comparative indifference with the comparative indifference views of unbounded prairie sheeted with driven snow no shadow or tree or twig to break the fixed trance of whiteness not so the sailor beholding the scenery at the Antar antarctic antarctic seas where at times by some infernal trick of legerdemain in the powers of frost and air he shivering and half shipwrecked instead of rainbow speaking hope and solace to his misery views that seems a boundless churchyard grinning upon him with its lean ice monuments and splintered crosses but thou sayest Methinks this white-led chapter about whiteness is but a white flag hung out, for, hung out from a craven soul thou surrenderest to a hippo, Dishmeal. Tell me why this strong young colt fold in some peaceful valley of Vermont, far removed from all beasts of prey, why is it that upon the sunniest day, if you but shake a fresh buffalo robe behind him, so that he cannot even see it, but only smells its wild animal muskiness, why will he start, snort, and with bursting eyes paw the ground in frenzies of affright? There is no remembrance in him of any gorings of wild creatures in his green northern home, so that the strange muskiness he smells cannot recall to him anything associated with the experience of former perils. For what knows he, this New England colt of the black bisons of distant Oregon? No, but here thou beholdest even a dumb brute, the instinct of the knowledge of the demonism in the world, though thousands of miles from Oregon. Still, when he smells that savage musk, the rending, goring bison, her bison herds are as present as to the deserted wild foal of the prairies, which this instant they may be trampling into dust. 
Thus, then, the muffled rollings of a milky sea, the bleak rustlings of the festooned frost of the mountains, the desolate shiftings of the wind-rowed snows of prairies, all these to Ishmael are as the shaking of that buffalo robe to the frightened colt. Though neither knows where lie the nameless things of which the mystic sign gives forth such hints, yet with me, as with the colt, somewhere those things must exist, though in many of its aspects this visible world seems formed in love, the invisible spheres were formed in fright. But yet not but not yet have we solved the incantation of this whiteness, and learned why it appeals with such power to the soul, and more strange and far more portentous, why, as we have seen, it is at once the most meaning symbol of spiritual things, nay, the very veil of the Christian's deity, and yet should and yet should be as it is the intensifying agent in things the most appalling to mankind. Is it that by its indefiniteness it shadows forth the heartless voids and immensities of the universe, and thus stabs us from behind with the thought of annihilation when beholding the white depths of the Milky Way? Or is it that in, as an essence whiteness is not so much a color as a visible essence of co absence of color, and at the same time the concrete of all colors? Is it for these reasons that there is such a dumb blankness, full of meaning, in a wide landscape of snows, a colorless, all color of atheism which from which we shrink. And when we consider that other, that other theory of the natural philosophers, that all of the earthly hues, every stately or lovely emblazoning, the sweet tinges of sunset skies and woods, yea, and the gilded velvets of butterflies and the butterfly cheeks of young girls, all these are but subtle deceits, not actually inherent in substances, but only laid on from without, so that all deified nature absolutely paints like a harlot, whose allurements cover nothing but the Char charnel house within, and when we proceed further and consider that the mystical cosmetic which produces every one of her hues, the great principle of light, forever remains white or colorless in itself, and if operating without medium upon matter, would touch all objects, even tulips and roses, with its own blank tinge, pondering all this, the palsied universe lies before us a, a leper, and like willful, willful travelers in Lapland, who refuse to wear colored and coloring glasses upon their eyes, so the wretched infidel gazes himself blind at the monumental white shroud that wraps all the prospect around him. And of all these things the albino whale was the symbol. Wonder ye then at the fiery hunt. That was crazy. <laughs> Have a good day, friends.